say that Tom is one of the most prolific architects for his generation. Uh, uh, I think uh, if you look at his bio, he's uh, got several uh, best paper and micro topics, three micro topics. Uh, two. Uh, two? That's two. Oh, two. Maybe. <laughs> I think it's only two. Oh, no, you're right. It is three. Crap. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, uh, I guess you hold some sort of, sort of the chair. Uh, so yeah, we have this. Chair. Yeah, they have a junior faculty so development chair, which is really nice. One of our faculty members endowed it in honor so of his own great. father after he got some huge windfall from a startup. So it's really very nice. And, uh, so it's, in addition to being prolific, I think Tom is one of the people who's done a lot, uh, some of the most work in this uh, energy efficiency area. Um, some very seminal papers in uh, the, the computational printing work. That's one of the micro top, uh, yeah. paper, right? It also just one topic. So you're right. It is three now because of that one. That's the third one. Um, and, uh, and also earlier work in uh, uh, server local power storage. Yeah. Called power Mac. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. So thanks for that, that kind of introduction, Fred. And what Fred didn't mention is that we've been collaborators for a while now. So um, one of the big Google grants that was awarded for energy efficient computing, uh, Fred and I were, were on that together along with some other colleagues. So it's a great pleasure to actually be here uh, in, in Santa Barbara. It turns out that I've actually never been anywhere between San Jose and LA. There's this you know vast, beautiful swath of, of California in between. And this is the first time that I've ventured anywhere into the middle. And I've also been entertained all day watching you huddle around outside in your jackets and your sweaters. Uh, you know, for, for Michigan, this is, this is definitely short sweater. So uh, it's certainly a pleasure to come and have it be balmy, uh, at least for me. Uh, so today, uh, as, as Fred said, I'm going to talk uh, about power management from, from smartphones to data centers. So really, I've smashed together uh, uh, two somewhat independent projects, but they're unified by this common theme that uh, energy efficiency really is sort of the new performance in computing systems at every scale. If we can find ways to improve energy efficiency, improve operations per joule, we'll be able to better meet all of these constraints that we face in systems from smartphones to data centers, right? So we have constraints because of cost on the amount of energy we consume. We have thermal constraints in a phone because you don't want to burn someone's ear while they're speaking on the phone or computing, and in the data center because we have to get all of that heat out of the room. We have to pay for all of the energy. We have battery life concerns. And we also have constraints on the peak power draw of all of these systems, partially driven by temperature constraints, which of course follows from, from peak power, and partially also from just the sheer amount of current that we're able to deliver to these systems. And so it's, it's really sort of the, the dire future that's facing the energy efficiency of computing systems that motivates a lot of the work that I and my students have been doing. And it's sort of the thread that ties together um, these two projects. Um, but so before I sort of jump into um, uh, the computational sprinting project, the project that focuses on smartphones, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, you know, talking about how we've gotten here in computer architecture and how it is that I can make this, this claim that uh, energy efficiency is the new performance. So, so for those of you who saw the EC faculty candidate talk uh, this morning by Eric Chung, it turns out that he's actually giving roughly the same motivation to, to drive uh, uh, his work. So this will be review for those of you. He did it much better than I, but I will attempt to uh, reprise some of the things that he said this morning. Uh, so every good architecture talk has to have a Moore's Law plot, right? You have to have bar graphs, and you have to have Moore's Law somewhere. Uh, and so uh, here's my Moore's Law part uh, graph. And I'm going to claim that there's really been a paradigm shift in uh, computing and in what we have to do to optimize performance in the last decade. Uh, and so the top line of this graph here is the, the picture of the rosy future that Eric also talked about, namely that for at least several more generations of silicon, we anticipate that we'll continue to be able to make transistors smaller, right? So this is an exponential scale here, and the red line is showing you the number of transistors you can uh, fit per unit area, and not only the historical trend, but also I'd say for probably another decade, uh, we anticipate to be able to continue putting more transistors on a chip. Uh, the Bottom line here, however, is the energy efficiency of the individual operation uh, on that chip. And if you can see, 
there's sort of a knee in that curve uh, around the year 2000 where historically we were doing pretty well on improving energy efficiency per operation, but in fact that trajectory of improvements slowed down. And I'll talk in a second about why that is. This top blue line up here is our ability, the total power draw of a chip. And again, for a long time, chips were drawing more and more power as we put more and more uh, transistors closer together. But at some point, again, we hit a constraint, and this is actually an economic constraint, on for a volume manufactured chip, how much heat we want to take out of that chip and still have sort of a sensible cost for the heat sink. And so, yes, we could probably build chips that dissipate 250 watts and do exotic water cooling of the chip and so on, but you're not going to be able to sell that to a mass market, and certainly you're not going to be able to do anything near that in the phone. And so around 100 watts turns out to be roughly the sweet spot on the maximum power dissipation that you would want uh, in any kind of server or desktop class system. And if this is sort of the, the limit on power dissipation of the chip, and this is the power draw per operation, just the product of those two gives us the performance of the chip. And because we've both hit limits on the total power draw, and we're no longer gaining energy efficiency as fast as we used to, the performance growth that we get from technology scaling is no longer as fast as consumers have come to expect, this doubling of performance that we get 18, every 18 months with Moore's Law. And so in the past, we would, it was relatively straightforward to convert transistors into customer value. We knew how to turn up the clock frequency and get more performance. And so we had the era of high performance computing. But ever since we've hit this inflection point, now we really need to focus on energy efficiency improvement as a means to increase performance. So this begs the question, what happens? Why is it that this purple curve here isn't continuing on the trajectory that it used to, uh, used to be on? And it turns out that although Moore's law is alive and well, an equally important law that unfortunately is not quite as famous is coming to an end. And that is the uh, observation that, that Robert Denard made uh, a very long time ago. Uh, what Denard observed is that as you make transistors smaller, uh, uh, when you shrink both of the dimensions of a transistor, um, you're going to, of course, increase then the density of transistors per unit area quadratically, right? We get smaller in both dimensions, so now there's the square, squared the number of transistors uh, within a particular area, and of course that would be a power density problem. However, because uh, power is proportional to voltage squared, if we can reduce supply voltage by that same factor alpha that we increased aerial density, we can end up breaking even on energy efficiency, because we'll get that same quadratic reduction uh, 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 in the, the, the power draw of the individual transistors. And moreover, because the transistors themselves get uh, slightly more energy efficient as we make them smaller, we can also increase the clock frequency. So we have this sort of virtuous cycle where we're getting more transistors, we're getting more energy efficient transistors, and yet cost is remaining constant because the chip isn't really getting any hotter. We're just fitting more transistors in the same area. So this was great. And this it was this more than Moore's Law that really drove sort of the boom in consumer electronics and all this amazing exponential scaling that we've now had for, for more than three decades. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we no longer have constant power per chip. What has happened is that leakage has killed off our ability to continue on this beautiful Denard scaling trend. So uh, in order to reduce the supply voltage of the chip, we also need to correspondingly reduce the threshold voltage that we use to distinguish zeros from ones. Otherwise, because of noise and so on, we won't be able to reliably tell when we have a zero and when we have a one. So each time we lowered supply voltage in the past, we'd also lower the threshold voltage of the individual transistors. However, as that threshold voltage gets smaller and smaller, the leakage current, the power that just goes through a transistor when it's off, grows exponentially. Uh, in, in addition, as the temperature of these chips goes up towards this sort of the, the temperatures that we see with 100 watt chips, uh, we also have an exponential growth in leakage due to temperature. Um, so in order to switch well, we need to keep sort of a rough ratio of one third between VDD and VTH. So we can no longer lower VDD. Right? If we do lower VDD any further, the growth in leakage will cause leakage power to dominate everything else. And it's, we don't really just want space heaters that, that, are, that are trying to do computation on our behalf. Uh, so this is really the quandary that faces us today. We can get more transistors, but because we cannot lower threshold voltage, we cannot lower supply voltage, and so those additional transistors imply an increase in power density. So there's no more free lunch. 
from the circuits guys, we as systems architects need to find system level approaches to take this bounty, Moore's bounty, which will continue giving us transistors, we need to translate that into customer value. Because people aren't going to buy a new cell phone just because we made the chip smaller. It has to be able to do something that the previous cell phone was unable to do. And we need to do that without exceeding thermal limits. And those thermal limits are putting a cap on how much power and how many transistors can switch at any time. So because of this, I argue energy efficiency is the new performance. If I find whatever trick, it doesn't matter what it is, that allows me to do the same operation with fewer joules, I can light up more transistors on the chip and I can turn those additional transistors into customer value. So today's talk uh, is about two topics that both tie to this theme of worrying about energy dissipation and worrying about thermal constraints. Uh, the first is focusing on systems like this one right here. Uh, in a nutshell, the idea of computational sprinting is to improve the responsiveness of applications on mobile phones, of bursty applications. You know, you hit a button on your phone and you're waiting for it to do something. We want to make it do that something faster by transiently exceeding the thermal constraint that, uh, um, that we have, this two watt limit that's the most power we can dissipate on a sustained basis before we end up burning your ear. Okay? Um, and so just like a biological system that sprints when there's something really important to do, we're going to design a computing system that can sprint when you need a burst of performance. However, because that's going to generate a bunch of heat, we're eventually going to need to dissipate that heat out to the ambient. And so just like a biological system, the phone is now going to have to catch its breath and wait for the heat to bleed away before it can sprint again. So we'll talk about some of the implications of this idea and some of the challenges it needs to be able to, to, to address to design uh, silicon systems that can sprint. Then time allowing, depending on how, uh, how many questions you guys have, uh, I'll briefly talk about the work we did with Google looking at power management for online data intensive services. So uh, online data intensive services, or OLDI, is a term that we coined uh, in collaboration with Luis Barroso and others at Google to describe these internet services that have the property that they need to process a huge amount of data, something like searching the entire web, but they need to do it at interactive speeds because there's a human at the other end of that web search request or other query waiting for the result to come back. Uh, and it turns out that this kind of service where it takes thousands to tens of thousands of computers working in tandem to meet the latency constraint to process all the data in time are almost a worst case scenario for power management techniques because a lot of the obvious low hanging fruit in terms of power management that works very well in other environments like sort of virtualization in your enterprise data center where you have banking applications that are hardly utilized or batch processing facilities where you can just shut servers off. A lot of the obvious approaches are very difficult to apply or are completely in inapplicable to these online data intensive services. So I'll give you a little bit of background on how Google Web Search works and then we'll take you through our study of various potential power management approaches and whether or not they actually provide an appealing power performance trade-off for something like web search. Uh, so again, so we'll jump in and I'll, I'll spend most of my time today talking about this project, Computational Sprinting. Uh, computational Sprinting is a joint effort between the University of Michigan and, the, and collaborators at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's also joint between sort of computer systems designers and mechanical engineers who are helping us uh, work on heat sinks for this kind of system, and also electrical engineers who are working on the energy delivery challenges of making cell phones that can sprint. So let me sort of start with a little bit of motivation. Uh, so perhaps you guys have heard of this, you know, this term dark silicon or the utilization wall. This is really a cute term that was coined by, I believe, the CTO of ARM to describe this notion that because of Moore's law, because of this Denard scaling uh, 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 ending that I talked about at the beginning of my talk, uh, we can put more transistors on the chip, but we can't turn them on all at the same time. And so the dark silicon is all the silicon that you can have from a cost perspective, because the economic sweet spot in the size of a chip is still sort of you know 150 millimeters squared or so. That's the size of the uh, the chip in the uh, in this phone right here. It's a pretty big chip, but if all of those transistors were on at the same time, uh, uh, you'd burn your ear. Right. Uh, so we have this increasing power density, can't use all the transistors all the time, and that's a particularly acute constraint in mobile devices because of the tight thermal limits. So one thing that a lot of researchers are pursuing uh, 
is the notion of using few transistors for a long time by creating dedicated accelerators for various functions that the phone might do. And you sort of switch the power budget over to that dedicated accelerator. So for example, we might do, have an accelerator for video playback while you're watching a movie, or a very uh, energy efficient accelerator for playing audio when you're just listening to, to music. And so there's examples of academic uh, efforts that have gone to even more extreme, sort of a sea of accelerators approach. Uh, uh, but all of these are targeting the notion of sustained compute. That is that the device is going to keep doing what it's doing all the time. Instead, our approach is to use all the transistors, but use them for only a very brief period of time. So that on the average, we end up having the same average power draw as the, as the system that ends up shifting the power budget around. Okay, so what we're going to do in computational sprinting is in a system that can really only sustain one core in a multi-core chip indefinitely. We're going to provision a lot of additional cores, these dark silicon cores. And when there's some burst of activity that's needed, when we have a computation that we want to accelerate, we're going to fire up all of that dark silicon, start heating up the chip, and try to get the computation done before the chip gets too hot. Uh, and the target here is responsiveness for bursty interactive applications. So this you know, sounds like an interesting idea. The real question that we sought to answer in our initial work on computational sprinting is, is this feasible? Are there any showstoppers from a power perspective, from a thermal perspective, from an application perspective that would prevent you from being able to design a chip for a burst of activity? And so what I'm going to do today is take you through a few of these challenges in detail. A couple of them I'm just sort of going to wave my hands past, but we, address, we talk about them in our papers. Uh, one area that I'm going to talk quite a bit about is the thermal challenges. So we're going to generate all this heat. How can we maximize both the intensity and duration of the sprints before the chip gets so hot that we have to shut everything down and start trying to cool off? And in particular, one of the solutions that I'm going to show you that, that we're continuing to work on is to take advantage of the latent heat of melting a phase change material. So we'll actually put some material within the package right up against the die that will actually melt to buffer up a whole bunch of thermal energy during the sprint. And then during the rest period after the sprint, that material will refreeze. And then once it's frozen again, we're ready to sprint the second time. And if you remember your, uh, your high school physics, there's an awful lot more uh, energy that can be stored in the latent heat of a material than in the specific heat of heating something up by just a few degrees C. Well, there are certainly electrical challenges to trying to design a sprinting system. Uh, one issue is how do you, you know, supply the peak currents. It turns out that the battery in a cell phone really can't power a 20 watt chip because uh, uh, you simply can't get that much current off of the one or two uh, lithium ion or lithium polymer battery cells that you have in a phone. Uh, and so there's, there's a challenge in how do you design a power delivery system that still fits in this form factor and yet can deliver peak currents. So we don't have a complete solution for that today. However, there's been a lot of work on hybrid electrical uh, energy systems. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that ultracapacitor battery hybrids, where we essentially charge up an ultracapacitor, much like an old-fashioned uh, 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 camera flash, and then dissipate all of that uh, ch uh, charge when we try to do the sprint, would be able to supply the peak currents that you'd need to, to do sprinting. Uh, I'm not going to talk much more about, about that today. Um, another challenge is that if we want to ramp up the power draw of a chip as rapidly as possible, we have to worry about the stability of the electrical distribution on the chip and off the chip. Uh, it turns out you can actually disrupt voltages to the point where you start mistaking zeros and ones for one another if you tr fire up a chip uh, too rapidly. Uh, again, the solution here is relatively straightforward. We simply have to extend the time over which we raise the power draw of the chip over a relatively brief interval of you know, a couple hundred microseconds. And that's much less than the human perceptiveness limit for, some, for, for the kinds of applications we're trying to do. Uh, so this turns out to actually not be that much of a challenge in practice. Finally, there are architectural challenges. So how do we design a chip in light of sprinting? How do we control sprints? This is a new resource that traditional operating systems have never had to think about optimizing before. And what does it mean for uh, a cell phone to be out of breath? How do we communicate that to the user? Should the operating system to de decide to invest all of its sort of thermal buffering into one sprint? Or should it you know, pace itself and run a little bit slower because it anticipates in the near future it's going to have to sprint again? Uh, and so these are some of the issues that we've been looking on in our follow-on work. And our paper at ASPLOS that's coming out in just about a month looks at sprint pacing and how should we design parallel programs 
that can take advantage of the fact that you might have to sprint at sort of various levels of intensity depending on how much thermal buffer you have available. So um, just to give you sort of one quantification up front, um, the study that we did uh, in our original paper on this, actually uh, this is already um, uh, more recent than that. Uh, we demonstrate on a real Core i7 test bed. We sort of engineer it to have the sprinting capability by taking off the heat sink, and I'll show you pictures of that. But we show that by sprinting beyond the a 10 watt sustainable power limit uh, that we enforce by controlling the thermal solution, we can actually get six times the responsiveness for vision workloads out of this eight core system, right? So out of a potential 8x speed up, we can recover 6.3x. All right, so, so just to uh, take you through sort of what was our motivation, why did we want to do this a little bit more slowly, uh, uh, you know, the, as we advance from silicon generation to silicon generation, which I'm, you know, representing with different colors here, we can get more and more cores in the same silicon area, but because Denard scaling is gone, the power level of that chip is going to go higher and higher if we operate the entire chip. And so if you look at temperature versus time, the temperature is going to rise faster and faster, and the equilibrium temperature will be higher relative to uh, uh, you know, the fixed ambient that we all walk around in. However, in a cell phone, uh, and you know, this over two generations could be as much as 10x. In a cell phone, we really have a very tight thermal limit because of the fact that the only way we can cool a phone is passive convection. And by the way, the phone is in a terrible environment. It's in your pocket, right? That's already a pretty horrible place to be. There's no airflow. Your pocket's pretty hot. So uh, you know, there's really a very tight power constraint because of that thermal limit. So how can we meet the thermal limit despite power density increases? Well, there are other alternatives behind, besides sprinting. One option would be to sort of enhance the cooling system. This is what we've been doing for years and years in the server space. So you start with a heat sink that looks like this. And then you know, a generation later, you need a fan that looks like that. And at some point, you need something that looks like this monstrosity here. Uh, uh, but this is clearly not a solution in the mobile space because we only have passive cooling as an option. Okay? So, well, what else could we do? Option number two would be let's make the chip smaller, right? This is a power density, you know, power per unit area problem, but we know how to design packages that can get a couple of watts out. So why don't we just make the chip smaller so that the total power dissipation stays constant, uh, and then we'll still be able to keep the chip within its power limit. Well, this of course works, but the problem, and this does conserve costs, right? The smaller a chip is, you know, the, the cost of a wafer stays approximately constant from generation to generation. And so this would yield a substantial cost savings for whoever Qualcomm or, or Samsung is manufacturing your cell phone chip. But while this does reduce costs, it sacrifices the customer benefit of Moore's Law. I don't care about buying a smaller chip. I want to buy a better chip. And so this, if we went down this path, is the end of the consumer electronics industry. We're not going to be able to keep getting people to upgrade their phone because the chip is smaller. So the solution that many people have followed is to decrease the active fraction of chip area. So we'll let some of the cores go dark. We'll only operate one core at a time. And so what we're asking in this project is what is the best way to extract application performance from this dark silicon, from all these cores that I know I can provision? How do I get value out of that? So our, I guess our, our taking off point is in contrast to the way we usually design computers for sustained performance, we want to design them for responsiveness. Okay? So there's lots of interactive mobile applications that have this property that there's an intense burst of computation in response to a user input event, followed by a period of idleness while the human's doing something, while we're waiting for you, know, you to read the screen and then hit the button again. Web browsing would be a prime example. But uh, you, know, you could imagine sort of face recognition or face identification, augmented reality, uh, uh, handwriting recognition, uh, or a turn-based interactive game. Uh, in all of these, our objective is to make the computing system fast enough so that the human doesn't perceive any delay at all. And it turns out that up to about 300 milliseconds for these sort of interactive, I do something and there's a response uh, uh, from the computer system, 300 milliseconds, if it's faster than that, it'll look like a, it was instantaneous to a human. Okay? So, our goal is to pack as much computing as we can into that 300 millisecond period that feels instantaneous. Okay? Uh, and moreover, what's important about this observation is we're not just talking about taking the things your phone does today and making the little spinny thing not show up on the phone for quite as long. What we're really talking about is trying to give you an order of magnitude more performance in that 300 milliseconds or 600 milliseconds, which if I'm an application developer will now allow me to select algorithms and 
try to pr pursue applications that I would have rejected out of hand initially because look, if it's going to take 10 seconds, it's not interesting to do something that's going to take 10 seconds. No human's going to wait. So the holy grail and what I and my team would like to develop is a phone where while I hold it up and face it at the audience, in the time that you're in frame on my phone, I can do, run a face identification al algorithm that tags you with my face, as my Facebook friend, right? that identifies who you are on my friend list. Right now, that's something that's about an order of magnitude beyond the computing capability of the phone. If we can use sprinting to give us one more order of magnitude of performance within that time frame, then we have the opportunity to do this, this kind of you know, on-the-fly face identification. I'm sure you could imagine a variety of other applications. That if we just had that one extra order of magnitude of performance, we could make sufficiently responsive applications. So that brings us to this idea of computational sprinting. And in particular, what we pr propose in this work is parallel computational sprinting. Right? We could, so computational sprinting is temporarily exceeding your thermal limit. Parallel computational sprinting is doing that by turning on more cores. Uh, so initially, when there's some burst of work to be done because the user has done something, we'll fire up all the cores on the chip. And so the power will spike. And temperature will begin r rising precipitously. Um, and there's some sort of T max that's safe for the, the device or safe for the rest of the thermal solution. And once temperature approaches that, uh, 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 I'm sorry. So the, the key thing that we're exploiting is the fact that it takes time for temperatures to rise. Because of the fact that materials have thermal capacitance, when the power goes up, this temperature doesn't instantly jump from you know, its initial temperature to the equilibrium temperature. It actually takes a while to get there. It's that delay that we're going to exploit in order to get more computation done. Okay? Uh, once we hit uh, uh, that T max where we're no longer safe to continue operating, we're going to have to go back down to a sustainable level of performance where the power draw of the chip is matched by its dissipation capability, the ambient. So basically, we'll have to go back down and finish the computation with just a single core. At some point, we'll complete the computation. Then we can put the chip completely to sleep. And now the temperature will begin dropping. And if we wait long enough, we'll drop back very close to the initial temperature, all the way to the initial temperature, and then we'll be ready to sprint again. Okay. Of course, a lot of this depends on how long do the sprints have to be, how intense do they have to be, uh, what is the pattern of user behavior, so that we can figure out how we should engineer uh, the, the thermal solution to enable sprinting. And that's some of the stuff that we're working on now in looking at traces of actual user activity. So you may have seen that this is somewhat similar to something that you might have in your laptop already. That's you know, Intel's Turbo Boost. So actually, Intel announced Turbo Boost a couple months after we started working on this project. Uh, and you know, we were concerned, oh no, are we scooped? Has Intel already done it? Uh, and in a sense, yes, Turbo Boost is uh, an example of transiently exceeding thermal limits. So under our definition, I would call Turbo Boost a form of computational sprinting. But Turbo Boost uses dynamic frequency and voltage scaling to increase the computational capability of a chip for a short period of time. And they go up about 25% in performance for you know, half a minute or so. What, what we're interested in is not 25% performance. We're interested in an order of magnitude of performance. And so there's really uh, uh, a difference of degree, uh, but almost a difference of kind in the objective that we're setting. We're trying to enable new applications. We're not trying to make your chip go 25% faster when one of the cores happens to be idle. So uh, recently, we've been investigating this idea with an actual hardware test bed, because it's much more fun to measure real things than for you to believe all the simulation results that I produce. Uh, so we took a quad core Core i7 desktop machine. We pulled off the heat sink, and we put a fan on top of it and tuned the fan speed so that the, uh, the, the, the heat dissipation was just enough to keep the, the temperature stable when we operated one core at the minimum frequency that the chip can operate. Um, so at idle, this particular chip draws about 4.5 watts. That's just if you have it on doing nothing. If you operate one core at 1.6 gigahertz, it draws just under that 10 watts that we tune the fan for. And that now gives us two forms of sprinting. We can turn on all four of the cores at their minimum frequency. That's a very energy efficient sprint, which brings the total power dissipation of the chip to about 20 watts. And we can also do a full bore maximum intensity sprint, where we turn every core up to its maximum frequency. And that brings this particular chip up to about 50 watts. So uh, in terms of temperature profile, if you, know, you put this thing in the lab and run it for a while, it'll settle at about 45 degrees C if you leave it idle long enough. And we have set a maximum safe temperature of 78 degrees C because that's what the manufacturer spec says is the highest temperature that you're supposed to uh, 
operate um, uh, the, the Sandy Bridge ship at. In fact, it'll go up to about 95 degrees C before it starts to panic. But, um, but we, you know, we didn't want to melt any chips, so, um, so we kept within their specs. The reason we're able to sprint is because this system, you can barely see it here in the photo, but there's actually a giant copper heat spreader that's about a little bit less than a millimeter thick and quite a bit bigger than the die. The die is just this little middle square centimeter, and this thing's you know, two and a half by two and a half centimeters. Uh, it turns out that that is actually quite a bit of copper. That's almost 20 grams of copper, and uh, 20 grams of copper can ab absorb 225 joules of heat over that 30 degrees C temperature rise from 45 to 78. So that's where we're going to dump the heat during the sprint. And I'll show you some of our, our, our newer uh, solutions, um, our, the newer heat sinks we've been designing in a moment. So basically, this is a model of a system with a 5x maximum sprint intensity. Right? We've engineered it by changing the thermal solution, but we can use this to study how should software behave when you have a system that can sprint. So here are some measured results on uh, the power and temperature response of, the, of this particular system. So um, the, the blue line here, this is power, this is temperature. The blue line represents the sustainable single core operation. The uh, uh, greenish, this bizarre color, greenish uh, 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 line is the energy efficient sprint with all the cores at minimum frequency. And the red line is the maximum intensity sprint. And you, down here are the corresponding temperature curves. And you can see with the maximum intensity sprints, we hit a limit temperature of 78 degrees within just a couple of seconds. However, we can actually sprint for quite a long time if we perform the energy efficient sprint. So one of the key questions here is sort of how long are these sprint durations uh, and how can we lengthen them? Okay. Uh, another thing that's sort of interesting to point out, you can actually even see in these graphs the uh, temperature dependent effect of leakage, right? The little upward slope you see on that power is actually the power draw of the chip increasing because its temperature is increasing. And so that's actually a large enough effect that you can see it, you know, it's right here observable on the graph. So this, this temperature delta here has a real impact on the power draw of the chip. So what does this mean then in terms of application performance and energy efficiency? So uh, let me show you a couple of obligatory bar graphs. This is for a set of, uh, 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 of image processing kernels, which sort of would be the kinds of things that this would work very well for since these algorithms parallelize well. Um, the top graph here is a performance graph. I'm showing you normalized speed up relative to the single core sustainable case for the maximum intensity sprint and the energy efficient sprint. Uh, and you know what it's showing you is parallelism works. If you use more cores to solve a problem, you get speed up. But you know, there's Amdahl's law. It's not perfectly linear, although it's fairly close to what you would expect, which would be a 4x speed up in the uh, on the 1.6 gigahertz case, and the maximum speed up you could get here is 8x. Right? Um, what's more interesting in this slide is the lower graph. So this is normalized energy. So this is how much energy did I consume doing the sprinting uh, relative to a system that just used that sustainable one core mode. And I've broken the energy bars into two pieces, the energy that's actually consumed during the sprint and the energy that the idle state consumes until the time I would have completed the computation anyway, right? Because we're going to switch back to that sleep mode, but we'll continue to draw power during the sleep mode. Okay? So there are a couple of interesting things here. First, one thing that surprised us quite a bit when we first saw it is if you look at these 1.6 gigahertz line, uh, bars, we're actually below one. Not only have we improved performance by up to a factor of four, we've actually improved energy efficiency by sprinting and then going to sleep relative to a system that simply did the entire computation slow and steady using a single core. Uh, moreover, if we could design chips with much better idle power, right? this chip has a 4.5 watt idle power. If that idle power were zero, the red part of these bars would go away. Then even our maximum intensity sprint would actually end up with an energy efficiency win in some cases. And so that would mean that designing a system that sprints and rests and sprints and rests and sprints and rests may actually be more energy efficient than a system that actually sustains computation indefinitely. And that actually turns out to be the case in this particular Sandy Bridge chip. Yes. Yeah, so what it has to do with is the fact that the, so the, the incremental power that it takes for me to turn on the first core that, that would get me to that sustainable mode, if the delta power to turn on the additional cores is lower than the delta performance that I get from turning them on, and if the sprint time and the rest time 
have the correct ratio. That sort of depends on the thermal solution. That you know, in this particular system, I think it's one to two and a half or so, or three. So it's actually it cools off relatively quickly, uh, uh, which might not be true in all you know for everything. Uh, then you end up with a net win from from sprinting and resting. But so, so if we were, if it were the case that every core had the same marginal power for turning on that core, so the cost of turning on the first core and the cost of turning the second core and so on were the same, then this, this idea wouldn't be a win. So it's really because of the background power. Exactly. But you know, I believe that that's inherent, right? There's so much stuff that you need to just turn on one core that it will always be the case that the incremental power for that first core is going to exceed what it takes to turn on the additional cores. So that's sort of promising if we can improve sleep power. And so this, you know, one of the takeaways from this is we really want better, even though 4.5 watts sounds great relative to a 50 watt you know, peak power for an Intel uh, uh, Sandy Bridge, it's still not good enough. We want that idle power to be as close to zero as possible to enable things like this. So I'll tell you about one more crazy idea and show you a little video on some of the work we've been doing with our mechanical engineering colleagues, and then I'll shift gears to talk briefly about data centers. Um, so Historically, when you designed a heat sink for a chip, your goal was to just get heat out as fast as possible. So the only thing you'd optimize your thermal solution for was thermal conductivity. Um, so you'd want as little capacitance near the die as possible. You just want to get the heat out. So fans, fins, whatever it takes to push the heat away from the chip. But with sprinting in mind, we've now created a new objective that heat sink designers have never had before, namely to add thermal capacitance near the die so that we can increase the intensity and duration of the sprints in addition to still having good thermal conductivity. And so what, one of the things that our mechanical engineering colleagues have been uh, investigating is actually building a phase change material into the heat sink. So uh, here's a picture of one of the recent prototypes that, that, that um, we've been working on. So that's Lei Xiao, one of our grad students' hands. He's holding uh, a heat sink that he himself built. So this is a, a sheet copper that he's folded around, I believe that is a uh, uh, it's a copper mesh that's coated with, I think, aluminum plating or something like that. And within that copper mesh, we've actually poured wax, candle wax. Candle wax has roughly the correct melting point, so it's about 55 degrees C. It has an excellent uh, um, latent heat. Unfortunately, it has terrible thermal conductivity, and so in order to get the heat into the wax fast enough to enable a sprint, we need this mesh. So the mesh is basically spreading the heat throughout the material, and then the wax sort of melts inside that copper vessel. Um, since then, now they've been working on uh, um, new metal alloys that have a melting point that's in the right range and have much better thermal conductivity than this mesh plus wax solution. Uh, but so I have a, you know, there's this neat video of one of the early prototypes that they built. Um, so this particular prototype is, um, it's uh, uh, aluminum fins, and this is just a clamp that's holding this heat sink firmly down on the chip. And you can see there's sort of this, um, opa opacity over the top of it. That's actually the, the layer of wax that's sitting on top of the mesh. So now if I play the, um, um, if I play the video here, over the 10 second sprint duration or so, you'll actually see that uh, the, the wax becomes transparent and you can see how fast actually the wax is melting. So this is the, the wax increasing in temperature by you know, 20 or so degrees from, from, uh, from 45 to 55 it melts and then it continues increasing to about 65 degrees. Uh, in terms of our measurements of this kind of solution, um, you know, we've been comparing uh, different heat sink designs and looking at sort of how much do they allow us to extend sprint duration. Um, so this isn't the very latest data set, but this is the data set that was nicely colored for presentation in slides. So I'm comparing that heat sink that you saw, the mesh um, within the, the copper packaging, filled with four different materials, air, uh, 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 so when we don't have anything at all, um, an empty, uh, 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 copper vessel, the filling it with wax, and also filling it with water. And the reason for the comparison between wax and water is that uh, water has about a factor of two higher specific heat than wax. And so uh, the fact that the wax gives us a longer sprint duration, which you can see because this peak here, the purple peak is furthest to the right, that implies that it's actually melting the material, right? That's the only way the physics could work out. And we've done, done the math to confirm that this sort of matches what you'd expect based on the temperature change and the amount of material and so on. And uh, uh, the, the numbers, uh, the measured results match up pretty well with what you'd predict from, from the weights and so on. So I'll pause here. That's all I had to say about sprinting, but I'll see if you have any questions before I move on to the, the, the latter part of my talk. Fred. Uh, 
if the, if the thermal conductivity of the PCM is lower, then you're going to get rid of heat worse. And that's actually one of the problems. You know, wax actually has pretty terrible conductivity. So we still need to worry about how well do we conduct heat to the ambient. However, you know, most of the time you're not operating your phone anywhere near its peak power levels, right? So the, the average power on the phone under a typical use case is nowhere near the two watts that it could draw at peak. However, you know, I, I suppose all of you have felt your phone get hot. So that certainly is a, solu uh, is, a, is a problem, and that's part of why we're looking at new materials now. I think, so paraffin was sort of the easy thing because it's non-toxic. We don't have to worry about killing the grad student. Uh, uh, but now we're looking at sort of more exotic materials um, to see if we can. Uh, no, I think when you're at low temperature, it's not going to make any difference. What, what you've done, though, is potentially by having worse thermal conductivity, you may have reduced the sustainable power cap, right? So the, the peak power that you can operate is going to be lower since we're trading off conductivity uh, for, for thermal capacitance. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so part of the, so this is only, you know, a Sandy Bridge chip with a fan still blowing on it. This is not really the experiment that we want. So what we're working on now is to actually get, um, um, you know, a thermal test chip in a phone case so we can look at the impact of the cooling time, the cool down time on the case of the phone. Because what we really have is a constraint on how hot the phone feels, right? Um, so I don't have a good answer for you on that yet. There is potential impact. The case is pretty big. Um, you know, you actually lose more heat the hotter you are, right? The, you know, the, the way thermodynamics works, right? If the temperature is higher, we'll actually bleed off heat faster. That's part of why you see these things drop. So there's two effects that are causing these things to drop really fast and then sort of stabilize. One is that we actually get hot, hot so fast that the heat doesn't even spread horizontally in the package. It actually takes a fairly long time for heat to spread laterally. In copper, it's like almost a, a second for it to go a centimeter horizontally. Through, this, through, through the heat spreader. And so part of this steep drop off is just the temperature equalizing at the point where we stop the chip since we're not dumping power in anymore. But then part of it also is that you know, this is always going to be an exponential curve. The hotter it is, the faster it's going to bleed off to the ambient. Right? So asymptotically, it should eventually get back to the temperature it started at. That actually is, no, uh, I believe empty is, so air is we don't have the heat sink on there at all. Empty is we put the heat sink and the mesh on there, but we don't fill it with anything. In the back. Yeah, have you looked at any uh, behavioral data? I'm curious to know just how this approach uh, will be received by the average user. Is that the typical you know, pattern? And you know, how many of are very compulsive? And so some people may be going in place and if they're told they're going to have a burst of reactivity and then they have to sit and wait for a while. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there's an unsolved HCI problem here, which is how do I present the notion? You know, do I have to reserve a bunch of sprint capacity? I only use a third of it every time because it's unlikely that the user will want to sprint three, three times in a row. I would be pretty upset with my phone telling me uh, I can't sprint right now. You need to wait 15 seconds for me to cool off. Um, so, so what we're doing now, there's two things that we're doing. So first of all, your feedback that, you know, I don't know how to sell this to users is the same feedback that we've gotten from a lot of companies on this idea. And actually, they're, they're, their problem is a little different. They agree, wow, this is cool. However, we sell chips to our OEMs based on benchmarks. And all of our benchmarks run for a minute or two. And so the fact that you can sprint for 300 milliseconds and do some amazing amount of computation, totally irrelevant. There's no way I can sell it to management. Um, so what that means is that there is a need for the community to create benchmark suites that measure responsiveness. And that's one of the things we're working on. We want to, we have, um, some of our colleagues at Michigan have collected traces of user activity on phones, the Power Tutor Project from Morley Mao and Robert Dick and Panopticon, which is currently under review, I'm currently under review, I don't think it's published yet, uh, um, where they've collected very fine-grained traces of user activity on phones. We're going to use those traces to construct benchmarks that represent a session that a user has interacting with a phone. So how often are they hitting buttons on the phone? What's the time between um, display update and, and sort of the, the input event? Uh, and then we'll use that to modulate a thermal test chip that will allow us then in turn to design 
thermal solution and sort of a, a, an operating system solution to match what users actually do. So I don't have an answer for you today. Hopefully within half a year to a year, we will actually both have a benchmark suite and be able to release this data on what does a user session look like so that we can have an understanding of how many times we need to be able to sprint and with what intensity. It's a great, it's a great open question. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So certainly I think computation offload to the cloud is an orthogonal approach to, to get speed up. Uh, the key question there is sort of in the energy balance of how good is your communication link, how much data do you need to offload, how much faster is the cloud going to be. And uh, so uh, again, I think there was a, a paper at, um, at, uh, at SOSP this, or OSDI, I guess it was OSDI this past year. I forget which one. The operating system conference that happened last year. Uh, um, looking at a virtual machine offload. So a virtual machine that gets mirrored in the cloud. This is also work from Morley's group, uh, uh, where they can do transparent offload at function call boundaries to the cloud and back. Um, so there's, and there's also a Microsoft project that's looking at that. Um, people are actively working on it, but when you have a bad radio link, you may end up burning more energy and more delay doing that upload. So I think that's much more credible for longer running things. If I have something that's going to take several seconds, tens of seconds, then maybe sending it to the cloud is going to end up with a net speed up. But if I have something I want to do in 300 milliseconds, I might not even be able to move the data to the cloud in 300 milliseconds. And the latencies of radio links are pretty bad. And so for what we're targeting here, where we're really trying to pack com compute into the human perceptiveness limit, uh, uh, it's sort of the time scale's wrong for offload. I'll take one more question, and then I'll just give you guys sort of a tidbits of the back half of this, and then I'll take a few more questions. Seconds, yeah. So this is a very long time because this is a, a um, so uh, the Sandy Bridge because of, so we can scale, uh, what, what we want is to go from 2 watts to 20 watts in a phone. What we're doing here is going from 5 watts or 10 watts to 50 watts and with a sort of scaled thermal solution. But what doesn't change is the thermal capacity of air and the ambient temperature and so on. And so the result of us scaling up to a desktop class processor is that all of these times are much, much longer than we would expect in what we envision in a phone. Uh, uh, but that, again, the jury remains out on that. Uh, we're not quite sure how long. It does look like we may be able to sprint for seconds. It sort of depends on what is the intensity and how much material can we pack in. I mean, there's, in a phone, there's lots of constraints. Like, you can't make it any thicker, right? So actually, you know, doing some of this stuff has some practical challenges still. All right, so with that, let me, um, I'll I'm happy to take more questions, uh, you know, after the talk or so on. But I'll at least try to give you, um, uh, a sampling of the work that we've done in power management for online data intensive services, but I'm not going to take you through all of these slides in detail. Um, so this is work that was joint with Google. My student, David Meisner, who has since graduated, did a series of internships where he went to Google and could play with the actual Google systems. And then, you know, he would come back and, and together we, um, you know, we, we wrote about our observations on how to do power management for these large scale interactive systems. Um, so sort of reiterating what I said before, Power is a first class constraint in the data center. Uh, uh, you know, it's estimated, I think this estimate's actually been revised down, but somewhere between two and two and a half percent of US energy is estimated to go to data centers at a cost, well, if it's 2.5%, it'd be $7.4 billion a year. Uh, annual data center carbon emissions worldwide are estimated to match 17 million households. That's the same as the entire Czech Republic. So data centers are as much as a country in terms of carbon emissions. And you know, energy is important for a number of reasons. It's not just uh, about the cost of the electricity that I purchase. It turns out that the peak power draw of a data center also drives the capital infrastructure costs for how much power distribution, how many batteries, uh, how much equipment I need to be able to buy. And so improving energy efficiency or being able to sort of shave peaks through power management techniques would also let me save money not only in the red part of the bar here, the electricity cost, but also the annualized cost of the power distribution infrastructure and buildings and so on that I need to buy to stand up a data center. So we're studying here online data intensive services. So that's something that processes terabytes of data with millisecond scale latency requirements. And we care a lot about tail latencies, right? Google cares very much how long it takes Google.com to be generated for you. So 99th percentile latency is important. And one of the key characteristics here is that the number of machines I need is determined by the amount of data I need to process 
and the latency constraint. It's not an issue of throughput. If, even if there's only one user, I still need 10,000 machines in order to do the Google web search fast enough. So in addition to web search, you know, deciding which ad to serve, doing machine translation, any of these interactive services would fall into this class. We're looking specifically at web search. And the motivation here is that there is large diurnal variation in the load. So the black line here is showing you the queries per second on one Google web cluster over the course of two 24-hour periods. And you can see that you know, there's the daytime for the customers that are directed to this particular cluster. And there's much lower activity in nighttime. But the dotted line here is the power draw of that cluster. And if we had energy proportional systems, that is systems where the power draw was linear in the value delivered by the computing system, the dotted line would be on top of the black line. But there's a massive gap, especially during periods of low load. So what we're doing is trying to figure out how do we save energy during those periods of 20 or 50 percent load. Okay. So what we've done in this study is we've done uh, two independent experiments. One where we study an entire uh, web search cluster uh, and measured the utilization of various components of the system, the CPU, the memory bandwidth, with the disks. Uh, and we use this to rule out power management features that we know from a throughput perspective could never be used. For example, if the CPUs are 75% utilized, I can't slow them down by a factor of two. I would no longer be able to keep up. I'd be over 100% uh, over utilization. This lets us rule a few things out. Uh, we then go on to look at the sort of latency versus power savings trade-off of a variety of low power modes and ask the question, is it possible to achieve energy proportionality given some allowable slowdown on the 95th or 99th percentile latency. Right? If the answer is I can't slow, down, slow things down at all, then the only answer is don't do any power management whatsoever. Okay? Um, so I'm going to uh, use this diagram as I sample through these slides to sort of eliminate uh, power modes that are not applicable for one reason or another as we rule things out. Uh, I won't take you through all of these different modes in detail, but basically I have component grain modes. And I, I've divided in this taxonomy power modes into two classes. Active low power modes, where the component continues operating, but does so with reduced performance. And idle low power modes, where I put the component to sleep, but of course when it's asleep it can't do anything. And usually you get more power savings from idle low power modes, but you can't do anything when the, the component is idling. Um, so uh, later in the slides, you know, there's examples of all of these things. So if you want to look at the slides that the Ener Energy Institute will have offline, you can see examples of different low power features that would fit into each of the various boxes here. Uh, active and idle low power modes at the component, full system, uh, and cluster level. At the cluster level, we have sort of virtual machine consolidation and shutdown. Uh, a very quick tour on how web search works. So uh, web search clusters are these sort of multi-level trees. A query comes in. Uh, it gets fanned out to leaf nodes, which are actually responsible for a fraction of the internet. Um, they all have an inverted index from words to documents. They'll return a list of documents that travels back up the tree. And there's some ranking and filtering. And then we'll go and actually get the snippets of those documents that we've selected as the highest rank that ends up getting, getting showed to you in the Google web search results. The, the key thing from this diagram is that these leaf nodes, there's a huge number of these leaf nodes. And so they dominate from a, a power provisioning perspective. We only have to worry about uh, optimizing energy efficiency of the leaves. Okay? Um, so one idea, one straw man idea would be let's shut down half of the cluster during the time when utilization is low. That's what you'd do if you had a batch processing cluster and half the cluster were idle. Well, if we do that in web search cluster, the problem is that we'll end up taking away the servers that have that fraction of the internet index in memory. And so if you do a web search for ice cream in, in Ann Arbor, you get this result here. I don't know why Billionaire Boys Club is the top result, but it is in fact the top result. Uh, but if you did this search and we didn't have part of the cluster on, then maybe we'd lose the uh, Wikipedia page or the Ben and Jerry's page. And no matter how much Google might want to save energy, they care about search query result relevance far, far more. Because that is, in fact, their competitive edge. And it remains their competitive edge over Bing today. So we can't use cluster level techniques because they'd cause us to lose part of the index. So in our throughput study, uh, 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 I'll take you through the, I think I'll take you through the throughput study and then I'll just sort of give you the, the conclusions from our latency study. Um, so what we're trying to do here is identify whether or not a power mode could be used at all. Uh, uh, or is the system going to end up overloaded if we, if we uh, utilize a particular low power mode. So what we did was we varied the load on the entire cluster, collected traces of CPU, memory bandwidth, and disk utilization at very fine granularity, and we came up with this visualization called an activity graph to be able to understand what this data is saying to us. So I'll walk you through one of these activity graphs, and then I'll 
show you how we interpret it, but first let me teach you how to read it. So the uh, uh, different lines here represent different levels of utilization, right? So the green line is 50% utilization. The, the black line would mean completely idle. The vertical axis is the fraction of time spent at that utilization level or less. And the horizontal axis is the time scale over which that utilization or less persists. So let me take one point. This point here that the arrow is pointing to basically says that CPU utilization was 50% or lower for a period that was at least one millisecond long 45% of the time. Okay? The implication of that data point is if I have a low power mode that slows down the CPU by a factor of two, I would be able to use it because I'm below 50% utilization, right? So nominally I double this line. I can use it 45% of the time, provided the time it takes me to switch in and out of that mode is much smaller than one millisecond, right? Because the, the, the uh, length of the individual periods is only one millisecond, right? So this is telling us both about transition time and about sort of how often we'd be able to use various low power modes. So hopefully that very brief introduction was enough to get you uh, at least a sense of how to read these graphs. Let me now pull what I can interpret out of it. Uh, uh, and then I think we'll, we'll jump to the end here, and I'll take more questions. So the first thing you can take away from this graph is that all of these lines are flat below one millisecond. That means there's no reason to try to design uh, switching between low power modes faster than about 100 microseconds. That's one order of magnitude better. If we could switch any faster, our opportunity isn't increasing anymore. Right? A second takeaway is that there's very little idleness in periods longer than 10 milliseconds. So unless we have idle power modes that, ex that switch extremely quickly, uh, uh, we're not really going to be able to save any energy with them. Right? And certainly if they're slower than about a one millisecond transition period, which is you, know, you can't shut a system down and boot it again, uh, you would have no opportunity to use that kind of low power mode in, in the Google web system. Uh, so with respect to our taxonomy here, I actually can't really eliminate anything because there certainly are periods of low utilization and there are also periods of idleness. Uh, I'll show you one more of these graphs, which is for memory. Um, this graph, of course, looks completely different. What you can see here is that there's massive periods of drastic underutilization of the memory system. Right? So there's a huge opportunity to slow the memory system down, to reduce memory bus frequency in order to save energy in these systems. And in fact, since we published this paper, Google has disclosed that they actually statically slow down the memory system. So they're buying DIMMs that could operate much faster than they do but in order to save power because they don't fully utilize memory bandwidth, they actually slow down all the memory buses in uh, all of their web search clusters. At the same time, the idleness line doesn't show up at all in this plot, right? You don't see a black line. So what that means is down to the granularity we were able to measure, there's no opportunity to shut parts of the memory system off. Basically, because of the fact that this is all hash lookup in giant tables, we're sort of spraying all of memory with requests and we're spraying them at a frequency that uh, uh, makes it very difficult to actually shut individual parts or the entire memory system down. You just don't have an idle period long enough. Okay? There might be something at sort of the sub-millisecond time scale, but um, nothing that we've been able to find. So here we can eliminate memory idle low power modes from consideration. So in the interests of time, uh, I'm not talking about disks. Disks transition way too slowly in and out of power modes. Um, those results are in the paper. I'm going to skip over all of the details of our, our, our second study where here now we've taken of these remaining low power modes, we've looked at sort of the latency impact of, for example, using dynamic frequency and voltage scaling or dynamically slowing down the memory system. And uh, I'll just skip over the detailed results. I'm happy to, to talk uh, with you about them later and go to sort of the end conclusion from this study. Uh, so what we have done is incrementally uh, 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 I've grayed out the active low power modes for CPU and memory. And what we discovered when we look at the latency versus power savings trade-off, if we only do active low power mode uh, management for, uh, uh, for the CPU and memory by themselves, we get sort of insufficient leverage in power savings because they don't account for enough of the total system power by themselves to actually provide an appealing power savings versus performance trade-off. Furthermore, I've also grayed out the idle low power modes uh, uh, for this, for this oh, if I click the button one more time, the idle low power mode for the CPU. 
while we can transition in and out of sleep modes on an Halem or Sandy Bridge chip in sub, you know, sub microseconds, like 40 microseconds or something like that, to go in and out of a sleep mode, uh, the chip is already so good at going into a low power mode when you hit the idle loop in the operating system that the incremental savings of using any of the deeper sleep states is in the noise relative to the full system power. So the answer here is Intel has done such a good job with respect to the rest of the server power engineering uh, processors that can idle that there's no reason to use any of the deeper sleeps. The, the net conclusion from our study is that the only hope of achieving an energy proportional system, that is a system that actually brings uh, power down to sort of be linear in the delivered value, is a system where we turn down CPU, memory, and disk in sort of a balanced and coordinated fashion. We dial down dynamic frequency and voltage scaling, memory bus frequency, uh, uh, and all of the other sort of peripheral I.O. frequencies with just the right knob so that the system remains in balance as a whole that sort of tracks the Pareto optimal with respect to the load, that will actually achieve energy proportionality averaged over the course of a day. Uh, unfortunately, to date, no one knows exactly how to do that. This is sort of an offline uh, ideal study. It's an open problem to actually design a control system that can dial down all of these knobs that are available in a server in a coordinated fashion. And so if you're looking for a problem to work on in power management, this is an open problem that, um, that certainly more progress could be made on. So I'll actually stop there. I'll just um, you know, flash up the conclusion slide. Uh, 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 and with that, you know, I'll invite your questions. Any more questions on this work? I'm sorry I had to skip over some of the details. Or uh, further questions on the uh, computational sprinting work. Yeah, um, yeah, so disk spin down is too slow um, uh, to actually do anything, so the disks have to stay spinning the whole time. We do know that Google is using spinning disks. We don't know if they're using anything else, but you know, I would be willing to bet they have looked at SSDs as a potential replacement. We also do know that Baidu, who's the Chinese competitor, has uh, stated publicly that they have no spinning disks in their web search clusters. They only have SSDs. And so in a solid state disk, you can transition in and out of it. I mean, you don't have to do anything. It just sort of, the power draw drops when quite precipitously when you when you're not accessing it. Sure, yeah, I can answer any other questions up here. Yeah, thanks for having me.